son Scott Bell as well as wife and dad. And today my very <laughs> special guest is Emily Schrader. I'm sure you all know her from Instagram. I think you have competition for the host of this show. Yeah. <laughs> They're looking at other conflicts through the lens of what the American political debates are. And you can't do that when it comes to the Middle East. You can't do that when it comes to Iran. It is an entire system of gender apartheid designed to oppress and discriminate against girls and women. Hi, welcome to Why with Adam. I'm your host, Adam Scott Bellows, and today we have a very special show for you today. Today, I'm joined by my very good friend and very special guest, journalist and social media expert from Ynet, Emily Schrader. You may know her from social media, but today we're going to get to know her a little bit. Emily, thanks for being here. So good to be here. So glad that you're here. Um, how are you? I'm great. You just got back from LA, yeah? Yeah, I've been all over the place the last few months. Europe, U.S. How long ago did you land? Uh, about two days ago. Oh, okay, good. So you're not like right off the plane today. I am not. Fantastic. Thank you for joining me. Little do people know that you are one of the very first guests on the concept show of this show when we were shooting it with iPhones. That is true. And that was three years ago, I want to say, in Nebetsedek. Yep. We had a very good time, no? Yes, of so, course. We're going to have a very good time today as well. I know that you're a very big fan of Gewürztraminer, so today we are going to be drinking the new blended Spring River White Blend from Gushetzion Winery. It's a mix of Gewürztraminer, Sauvignon Blanc, Pinot Grigio, and Chardonnay. I mean, that's all the things I like. So, so. pretty much it's a, just a mishmash of great white wine. There's nothing better to talk about human rights while cheersing with wine, yes. right? Yeah, there you go, the L'chaim. L'chaim. Very light it's and very sweet good. and fruity. Yeah, it's very it's My good. favorite three things in wine. So it's a good fit. You picked the right one for I me. I picked the right one for you? <laughs> okay, great. Fantastic. Okay, let's dive in. Emily Schrader, you're a, a daughter. I am a daughter, yes. You are a daughter, <laughs> yeah. You're a human rights activist and fighter, a journalist. You did your undergrad in political science at USC. You did your master's in political communication at, at Tel Aviv University. Uh, and what a lot of, I don't know if a lot of people know this about you, but you did experimental treatment to treat MS with chemotherapy. Yeah. And it was like a month out of your life. And it was probably one of the toughest things that anybody can go through. And so the first question that I have for you is this, what did going through that experience, like what was the end result of it mentally? Mentally, ooh. I mean, I think the, first of all, the team who did all of the procedure was amazing and uh, my results medically have been phenomenal. It's completely stopped the progression of the disease and for those who don't know, multiple sclerosis is a progressive disease over time and there isn't a set cure, but this is one of the most innovative treatments. It's called HSCT. Um, it is very difficult because it involves full chemotherapy, but um, it was actually a really interesting time when I did it because I remember that in the orientation for this procedure, Hamas was firing hundreds of rockets at Israel. And at the time I was working for a pro-Israel organization, as I have for the last 15 years of my life in one capacity or another, um, and I was like having to work at the same time that I was doing this because of what was happening. Did, did it affect your work in any way? I mean, of course it affected my work. I was prepared to not work at all because you just don't really know what to expect in mm -hmm. that type of situation. I ended up working like a little bit here or there, but obviously wherever I go and whatever I do, and also because it's social media that I'm you know, working on so much of the time, you're never really away from it, which is both a healthy and unhealthy thing. <laughs> healthy in that you know what's going on, unhealthy in the way that sometimes it's important to turn off. Um, and I didn't really have that. Most people who don't know you personally wouldn't know this, but you, your career really started because you became a social media expert and you built one of the most powerful pro-Israel platforms that are that is really in existence today. And the organization probably wouldn't be as successful as they are without it, which is the Stand With Us platform. I mean, that was like your baby and done from scratch, but it's a pretty long stretch going from nearly becoming a professional figure skater to being considered the most important expert on social media in the pro-Israel space. So give me like a couple of minutes on, on how that happens. So, I mean, I grew up, 
ice skating was like that was my childhood. Um, and as I became more, you know, a teenager and in my young adult years, I quit figure skating competitively, although I still am certified to coach and do occasionally. Um, and yeah, the shift to the whole digital sphere, not just social media, but also writing and blogging, um, that was sort of what pushed me in that direction was writing. Uh, and I, my background on the digital front for social was related to working on political campaigns in uh -huh. the U.S. actually before um, I started working with Stand With Us. And the reason it shifted to being about Israel and ultimately following anti-Semitism and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on social media for many, many years now was sort of triggered by the anti-Israel activity on campus at USC. It was the apartheid week and the apartheid wall that really led me to, I guess, be mad enough to do something. Uh, and I just couldn't understand why they were so obsessed, like A, with Jews, but B, with Israel as well. You know, it was a bunch at, at USC at the time. It wasn't even Arab students. It was random white students who mostly were in the communist club that were obsessing over Israel every year, putting on all these programmings with extremist speakers. And it was much better then than it is now, but it was still bad then. So that was what motivated me to get involved. Um, and I started, uh, I started working with uh, Stand With Us, the pro-Israel organization you mentioned. And they didn't really have anything digitally. I think they had like an account that existed, but no one was doing it. So they didn't have an Instagram at all when right. I started. I launched the Instagram. Um, I believe there was a Twitter account, but it wasn't active. It had like one follower or something. It was like they set it up to save the username, I believe. Me and, and all of the team, the digital team that, uh, that I worked with, we really built something uh, special, I think. And of course, one of my interests and passions at the time through social media was also educating about what was happening with Israel in other languages because that was really lacking, especially Arabic. That was one of the first pro-Israel organizations to do an Arabic page. That was one of my, my major initiatives with Arabic. I, me and, and me alone pretty much pushed for um, an Arabic page, an Arabic presence on Instagram and, and Twitter. And for a long time, Stand With Us was one of the only non-governmental organizations doing anything in Arabic. So you leave Stand With Us and you begin something called Social Light Creative, which is marketing for individuals and businesses and NGOs. And as well, I, I believe you did a couple of political campaigns, if I'm correct. Yeah, we have worked with uh, politicians, with public figures who are already elected um, or appointed in some cases. I want to kind of get into your new work that you're becoming much more well-known for, which is you as a human rights activist. And that's kind of where I feel like your entire career has kind of pushed you to, if that makes sense. Kind of thinking about going from a competitive athlete to this like social media expert to now really being like a full-blown journalist trying to kind of shed light on uh, specifically what's going on in Iran mm -hmm. and China. Russia's Putin, China's Communist Party, and Iran's Islamic regime. What do they all have in common? If you guess widespread human rights violations, you'd be correct, but that's not all. The most brilliant thing that you do is you highlight how hypocritical the Western world is when it comes to what's going on in Iran. So what went through your head when you were like, I have to become the spokesperson for these women internationally. I mean, the issues in Iran, specifically as it pertains to women, is something I've written about for a long time. Like even in my own social media, I, it's not actually new, nor is following and updating about the uh, protests and waves of protests that have happened in Iran. I've been creating a lot more video content about what's happening in Iran, and um, it's become quite popular inside of Iran, actually. That's why I have a lot of Persian uh, posts and, of course, subtitles on any of my videos. And I've also done a lot of press in the Persian media mm -hmm. as well. Not the regime's Persian media, but in the Persian media. To be fair, what I said wasn't actually correct. I haven't done an interview with them. However, I right. have been featured quite a bit in the regime's news. Uh, about how I'm a secret Mossad agent. I even got promoted. First they called me a Mossad agent, and then they told me that I'm the head of the Iran desk for the Mossad. So okay. you never know what's going to happen. So let's dive into <laughs> Iran. What do you think is the biggest misconception globally about Iran? That you can negotiate with this regime. What do you think is the biggest misconception about the situation currently right now? that you can negotiate with this regime. What do you think <laughs> is the biggest mistake that the United States has made in terms of Iran? I mean, there's so many to choose oh, from. Oh, I was hoping that you were going to say that you think that you could negotiate with Iran. That is one of them. That is one of that them. That is one of them, absolutely. So, but of course, releasing funds 
to the Ayatollahs is a huge uh, problem. How do you feel when people refer to Biden as Obama 2.0? I mean, it makes sense based on his policies. His foreign policy has been abysmal. And by the way, it's not just with Iran. I mean, if you look at the debacle of Afghanistan, and I know that people who are inclined one way or the other politically will say, oh, well, it's because so-and-so before him did such and such. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. He's the president now. He bears responsibility for what happens. And he is the one who insisted that they do it the way they did it. And as a result of that, half of the population is now systematically oppressed under gender apartheid, no different than what they're experiencing in Iran, actually worse because they're banned from education. Um, and it's only going to get worse. And yes, Biden bears at least partial responsibility for that. So why do you think people are still attempting to negotiate after the failure of the JCPOA? They're kicking it down the road. I mean, that's what the JCPOA was from the beginning. Mm -hmm. They don't want to deal with the reality of the Islamic Republic. A lot of people can criticize Donald Trump for a lot of different things that he did. But it was very clear that his policy in Iran was absolutely excellent and effective and nearly bankrupted the Ayatollahs. Uh -huh. uh, and it almost brought the regime down. Why do you think Biden decided to reverse policy? I mean, I think that Biden is of the same school of thought as Obama and his advisors when it comes to the Middle East. And let's not forget that when it comes to lobbying efforts in Washington, D.C., NIAC, which is uh, the, I guess, largest lobby on behalf of the Iranian-American relations, although really they are a lobbying organization that coincidentally always promotes what's in the interest of maintaining the regime. There are also a lot of suspicious ties between that organization and regime officials, both past and present. And so this is the organization that sort of has its claws in and is very involved with the Democratic Party mm -hmm. in the U.S. Um, you know, Ilhan Omar, for example, was honored by them, got an award from them. They've donated to her campaign, to Rashida Tlaib's campaign. So they so are... are there Democratic officials that are bought by Iran? Would you go so far as to say that? Uh, no, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say that because the evidence doesn't prove that beyond a shadow of a doubt. <laughs> right. But and in terms I am of not their, the but Justice it, Department. But in, but in terms, terms of their of the voting policies, pattern. Yes. In terms of how they act, the statements they make and the policies that they promote. Yes, they are policies that enable the Islamic Republic to continue existing. And that is the problem. This is not an organization that's working in the interests of the Iranian people or the Iranian American people. They're, in fact, against their interests, which is why when you have protests in New York and L.A., they're chanting about how Nayak supports dictators. That's literally one of their chants. So these are the people that are working in the Biden administration, like Rob Malley, who's the special envoy for Iran. Mm -hmm. um, he is very closely allied with Nayak and has been for many years. And he's the person who has been pushing to return to negotiations. And negotiations and diplomacy sounds great when you're not dealing with a terrorist mafia regime that executes 142 people in the month of May alone. What, what did you say in one of your most recent reels, six people an hour? Something yes, like that? an average of, of about six people an hour this year. Yeah. Have been killed. Yep. How is that possible? How do you have a situation in today's world, especially after the Me Too movement, where this is acceptable and acceptable for democratically elected women of liberal countries who have the right to drive, who have the right to vote, who have the right to an education, who have the right to wear whatever the hell they want. How th is this acceptable? Because I mean, they're misleading the public on what the results will be. But you are know, they, everyone are wants to really, avoid though? a war. No random American on the street wants another situation like we had in Iraq or, frankly, Afghanistan. Um, they don't want that. So without understanding what's actually happening in Iran and how evil this regime really is and what the cost of capitulation is, they don't understand that if you don't deal with Iran now, you're going to have to deal with it later and it's going to be worse. And this is something that I always tell European lawmakers when I meet with them, that no matter how many deals you have now, this is a regime which cannot be trusted. And they have proven it for 44 years against their own people. So why are you still negotiating with them? Americans, your average American doesn't understand this. And it's been sort of, and they do this with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as well, it's been Americanized. They're looking at other conflicts through the lens of what the American political debates are. And you can't do that when it comes to the Middle East. You can't do that when it comes to Iran. It's not that simple. It's not the same as, you know, a, a woman being paid less than a man. It is an entire system of gender apartheid designed to oppress and discriminate against girls and women, designed to excuse honor killings, designed to excuse rape of senior officials when they arrest young women like Masa Amini, what happened to her, 
by the morality police and by the IRGC. Mm -hmm. So in terms of understanding what's going on in Iran, it's a foreign concept to us in the West because we don't have egregious human rights violations at that same level. It's hard to even comprehend, even for me, and I'm in it. But what I don't understand is, is that they're running on a liberal platform. They're running on the idea of human rights and freedom of expression. They're, I mean, if you if you look at the LGBTQ community and who they vote for, they're a voting Democrat. Yet the Democrats are globally actually repressing their community around the world by who they're supporting. I'm trying to understand. That's what I'm trying to expose is that it doesn't make any sense. It's completely contradictory to everything that the West claims to represent. But yes, it's absolutely true today that the policies that the West, meaning Western Europe, United States, Canada, the policies that they are promoting and encouraging are enabling the regime to survive. Every time they give money to the Ayatollahs, to the mullahs in Iran, it's not going to the people of Iran. Sanction relief isn't helping the people of Iran ever. It doesn't go to them. It goes to terrorist proxies in Syria, in Lebanon, in Yemen, in Iraq, in all of these countries that everywhere the Islamic regime has exported their terrorism, people are dying. And by the way, another important thing is that the majority of people who are dying under this regime outside of Iran are Arab Muslims. It's not Israelis. It's not Jews. It's not Westerners. So basically, they're the largest committers of genocide and yes. terrorism on earth. And the United States is continuing to placate them and yes. support them and prop up the regime. That's why all the work I've been doing in the last few months, other than meeting with actual lawmakers um, all over the world, actually, is to educate general population, you know, Americans, Europeans, about why it's so important to push back. And Europe has an interesting problem because they're debating designating the IRGC as a terrorist organization, which the United States already did, uh -huh. actually. The reality, both for the UK and the rest of the EU, is that um, implementation is very, very difficult because it would require them cracking down on a lot of different, not just uh, individuals, but companies that are doing mutual business. It would affect um, the economy. You need to somehow convince the people of Europe that despite the fact that cutting off, essentially cutting off relations with the Islamic Republic will have a better long-term result than now. And what would happen now? Their their energy prices are going to go through the roof. Because remember, they also sanctioned Russia. Right. So they, some of Europe wasn't even sure they were going to have heating last winter. Mm -hmm. So that's the situation that they're coming from. So of course, lawmakers aren't going to be excited to go label the IRGC as a terrorist organization, potentially damage any sort of leverage that they have, which I reject completely, but that's their argument. Um, and, and potentially increase daily uh, living expenses for their voters. Mm -hmm. So they're act actually acting against short-term interests for the sake of long-term interests, and that requires a lot of education of a population. They need to understand why it's important. And it's important, in short, because whatever is happening in Iran to na right now is what's going to happen tomorrow in Europe. That is their vision. That is the plan of the Islamic Republic. They're not interested in the success and the growth of the, the nation of Iran. They don't even care about Iran. They'll burn the whole country down before they'll give up their genocidal ambitions. Mm -hmm. Their goal is to promote a religious theocracy and export that, and they've proven that abundantly, and it's high time that any Western leader accept this. Otherwise, they're just willfully ignorant. Recently, China brokered an agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and it. Uh, some people behind the scenes are saying that Saudi Arabia did it only to kind of get the United States to wake up, and that they don't really have any ambitions to create a relationship with China like they do the United States. At the same time, people see that the United States' foreign policy has been shifting like crazy for the last 24 years um, and that they can't make up their mind and that they're an untrustworthy partner and a falling empire, so to speak. How do you feel about like this treaty? I mean, I think and, and what messages do you think it sends to the Western world and to Israel? I mean, I think that it's been clear in the last 10, 20 years that the Gulf states, especially want relations with the United States. Um, they want to have a mutually beneficial relationship with the United States. But yes, under Obama and also under Biden, they don't feel like they can trust the United States. And why would they? There's no reason to believe that. I mean, the United States has been abysmal on foreign policy and they've been very weak on Iran, which, by the way, ironically, is one of the reasons that the Gulf states are shying away from the United States, because the United States has proven they don't have Saudis back. They don't have the back of any of their other Gulf allies when it comes to Iran. And that's a huge, huge problem. So it's not shocking at all that they turn to China. It's disturbing. It's alarming. But it's not shocking at all. So what's the scariest thing about China and Iran teaming up? As it stands today, China is like one of the only countries that will buy oil from uh, from Iran. 
So that is one reason that Iran is closer to China. Mm -hmm. um, they're both oppressive authoritarian regimes uh, that brutally control and abuse their own people. So ideologically, despite the fact one is Islamic and one is communist, um, we've seen that match from hell in the past as well with communist terrorist organizations. Well, that was and the Islamist. entire Soviet, you know, Arab bloc of the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Or yeah. really the late 60s to the and the Red Army Faction Terror Group worked with the was trained by the PLO mm -hmm. in Jordan. So these alliances are not unfortunately new, but that is again what's happening. And I think the, actually the more disturbing thing right now is Iran's uh, weapons sales to Russia uh, in the conflict with Ukraine, which has been a, a horrific, um, you know, display of violence beyond just what we had seen from Russia initially. So, so you look at you look at the United States' decision with Iran. You look at the United States' decision to be super passive with China and their not only like expansionist ideology and their Silk Road project and the fact that they're buying all of Africa, okay? You also see what they're doing with Russia mm -hmm. and how for the second time since Obama, a red line was publicly stated and then nothing was done. Yep. Explain to me what's going on because... I mean, it, it does seem like the land of the free and the home of the brave has decided that the rest of the world can go to hell. We don't care. Yeah. What's this? What What do you think of the long term implications for America? I mean, long term, it's too soon to say because everything could change with an election, as we have unfortunately seen. Right. Which with is the very election true. of Biden. So I don't how know much, that how much this change? has a long term impact on it other than. Other than if the United States and partners allow the Islamic Republic to get a nuclear weapon, because if they have a nuclear weapon, it will be North Korea all over again. And that regime changing is almost impossible. Uh -huh. And that is why they want a nuclear weapon. Right. Yes, they want to bomb Israel. Yeah. But they also want that as an insurance policy because nobody internally or externally will be able to get rid of the Islamic Republic if they have a nuclear weapon. And that is yet another reason why, forget about Israel's side, obviously we know why we wouldn't want Iran to have a nuclear weapon, but the West shouldn't either. You're, you're looking at the three largest human rights violators in the world. Yep. Not only, uh, China has nuclear weapons, Russia has nuclear weapons, Iran does not. But you'd be looking at the big three not only becoming all nuclear powers, but having the ability to actually challenge the United States on their own. Yes. So... I mean, it's a it's a lack of leadership. It's a lack of backbone. The problem with the U.S. is that they don't have any loyalty. So instead of standing up for Ukraine and going 110 percent to support Ukraine, they're sort of, OK, we'll give them some money and, you know, we won't really get involved with this. And never mind the fact that Iran is selling, you know, suicide drones to Russia. We're just going to ignore that for now. And, and yeah, let's release the frozen assets of the Islamic Republic. What could go wrong? Giving them 10 billion dollars. So they're they're kind of playing both sides. On this and that doesn't work that doesn't work on the international stage at least with these types of uh actors who do you who do you like right now that's running for president on the republican side oh i don't know i mean i i don't like to endorse or support I, anyone I'm specific candidate. i mean like is there is there is there anybody's policy who you think has that that's been honestly laid out? i think that anybody with the exception of kamala harris um anybody running against biden is better mm -hmm. um it from on the left or right, and uh, when it comes to the Republicans, uh, obviously Nikki Haley is someone that I have admired for quite some time on her foreign policy from the UN until today, uh, and also Ron DeSantis, he would be great as well. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll have to see. We'll have to see what happens with the with the Republican Party. I'm getting ready to study for my bar mitzvah, and I'm 13 years old. Okay. What, uh, if you could sum up everything that you've learned uh, from being a figure skater to becoming a human rights activist, in one sentence, what would that be? I think this applies to, um, to the issues of anti-Semitism. It applies to the issues of campus and anti-Israel bias. Um, it also applies to the situation with Iran and frankly, all human rights issues. And that is that people need to be proud of who they are um, be proud of their identity and not be afraid to call others out when there is discrimination or when there is wrongdoing. And this is something I think is lacking in a lot of people for a variety of different reasons. Some people are insecure. Some people don't feel like they know enough about a certain topic to push back. 
And it's something I always encourage in, in lectures or in conversations with students, especially, is that you don't need to have all the answers. You don't need to be an expert on every single thing that happens as it pertains to human rights violations in Iran, or as it pertains to the situation in Afghanistan, or as it pertains to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But what you do need to do is know who you are, know what you stand for and what your core values are, and let that guide you. Have a backbone. Yes. Have a backbone. There we go. There's my one sentence. Have a backbone. <laughs> I want to say thank you to my very special guest, a very good friend, Emily Schrader, for joining us. Today we are drinking the Spring River White Blend from the Gush Etzion Winery. And if you like the wine that we are drinking, you can get it at wineonthevine.org slash US, or it's maybe dot US now. And if you want to plant a vine with the Gush Etzion Winery, you can do that at wineonthevine.org slash JNS. And remember, when you are drinking your Israeli wine, drink it with somebody you love. L'chaim. L'chaim.